Welcome to our colloquium series at the center. Um, I'm David Winnikoff. I am in charge of the program in STS and I'm an associate director of, the, of customs. Um, today um, it's my pleasure to introduce our colloquium speaker, um, a good friend and colleague of the center, Jenna Burrell. Uh, an associate professor in the, the UC Berkeley School of Information. Professor Burrell holds a BA in Computer Science from Cornell and a PhD in Sociology from the London School of Economics. And I should say this semester we're trying to bring um, some of our own faculty who are involved in the center to the, the colloquium series because in general we don't hear enough about our own colleagues research um, sort of contemporary up-to-date research so that was part of the idea of bringing Jenna in. For two years before her PhD she was an application developer with Intel uh, collaborating with a, within a group of social scientists to study work practice, domestic life and technology use Europe, Asia, and Latin America. So that's, I think, fairly unusual. Um, but also because there are so many interesting. Um, the following is public knowledge. She keeps uh, post-it notes on her bedside table because, quote, ideas, some good, some bad, tend to occur to me just as I'm about to drift off to sleep. Evidently, she's had some very good ones um, because her impressive uh, 2012 book, uh, Invisible Users, Youth in the Internet Cafes of Urban Ghana, was published by MIT Press. And it tracks urban youth who frequent the internet ca cafes of Accra, Ghana, as they use the internet to orchestrate foreign connections, activities once limited to the wealthy, university-educated classes. Um, in this work, Professor Burrell describes the material space of the urban internet cafe and diverse kinds of virtual space between young Ghanaians and the foreigners they encounter online. She explores a famous set of scam strategies uh, from the region and the rumors of big gains uh, that fueled them. The influential role of churches and theories about how the supernatural operates through the, through the network and the development, development rhetoric about digital technologies and the future viability of African internet cafes in the region. And she does this um, with ethnography, kind of an embedded um, feel, but also very attentive to the structural elements, I think, going on uh, in Ghana. So it's a, a powerful combination. She captures the interpretive flexibility of technology by users in the margins, but also highlights how their invisibil invisibility puts limits on their full inclusion into a global network society. In her more recent projects, uh, Professor Burrell has continued to focus on the impact of large-scale technology diffusion on individuals, families, and societies, but across a larger array of far-flung locales, um, from Sub-Saharan Africa, India, Uganda, and rural China, and we'll hear about a few of those today. This more recent work has been supported in part by a $400,000 NSF award, how marginalized populations self-organize with digital tools, ethnographic case studies in Africa and China. Professor Burrell, in her own writing and pedagogy at Berkeley, has an abiding interest in using and improving ethnographic methods to get at the cultures of information technology. She tends to employ ground-level ethnographic perspective in order to capture rich, local commentary on technology and development issues. She's helped conceptualize the field site as a network that incorporates physical, virtual, and imagined spaces. And she has helped detail logistical issues and practical steps to constructing such a field site. So um, the question of ethnography and method I think is central to some of her interests and I, I hope will come up in her talk, but I think it's also something that uh, we might talk about in the Q&A because I know uh, methods are of high concern for a, a lot of people. Um, the center thanks her for being an important part of the community and warmly welcomes her for the talk. Jenna Burrell. Janet, let me just give you this. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay. All right, so the title of my talk, as advertised, um, 
was on the importance of price information to fishers and to economists. And that didn't quite fit into my slide, so I, I went with the slightly bolder title, um, The Myth of Market Price Information. Um, and I'm going to be talking about a particular way of conceptualizing market price information, which I describe as a development truism. Um, I don't mean to suggest that market prices don't exist. Of course, they exist. Um, but a certain way of handling this idea in, in development policy and in the aid sector um, seems to be this kind of um, multi-headed monster that pops up absolutely everywhere. And I'll talk a little bit about where, I, where I'm seeing that and what I think about it. So I want to talk more broadly about the recent career of information as a concept in the aid sector and in development policy. And I trace that back to um, you know, reading some of Peter Evans' work. He's here in the sociology department. I trace that back to the notion of capital fundamentalism and its decline as sort of an explanation for poverty. So this idea of poverty is that development would be accomplished by increasing the stock of capital in poor countries and for various reasons that, that proved kind of infeasible theoretically and, and not practically true as well. So that left sort of a void. What fills the void after we've sort of declared that capital isn't the kind of simple solution to poverty? There are various um, things that have been placed in that void, and I, I would suggest that information is one of those, those things. And specifically, there's a sort of a, what I'm calling the information scarcity thesis, which is composed of sort of three elements. One is this idea that um, information is now globally abundant, but maldistributed that there are places in the world that have hardly any of it. Um, and that is, this is a reason, sometimes even the reason, for poverty in these places. But that with advances in digital technology and network infrastructure, it's now radically less expensive to make information available to those who lack it. And that's how we will tackle this problem of, of information scarcity and consequently of poverty itself. Uh, my study, or I should say, is sort of a series of studies that have unfolded um, sometimes through happy accidents over the course of like eight years now. The first bit of field work I did towards this project was in 2008. And these studies um, all sort of go to try and concretely investigate and, un and unpack this thesis. Um, and to be a little bit more specific, you know, about information, it's this very broad, um, complicated, ambiguous concept. We have a whole school of it over there, and we're all talking about it in slightly different ways. Um, so to bring in the scope of consideration, I, I've been looking at specifically at one type of information, which is market price information. Um, the concept of market price information. So in domains of expert knowledge and practice in you know, reports of the World Bank in, and also in mass media coverage and outlets like The Economist, um, you'll sort of relentlessly hear this claim that farmers in Africa, in the global south, in poor rural regions are using mobile phones to get access to market price information. And that through this market price information, they are getting better profits for their goods. It's sort of the quintessential success story in some ways. Um, my interest in this originated in a contradiction I observed as soon as I went off to do field work and I started talking to farmers, traders, guys who stand by the side of the road in Uganda and sell matoke and ask them about some of these services that deliver market price information, ask them about the way they use their mobile phones, and just couldn't find a strong confirmation that that was a compelling um, use of their phone to get market price information. So starting with that contradiction, um, I've sort of over the years have tackled this question of what is at the, the source of that contradiction in a number of different ways. Um, through a series of relatively short ethnographic projects, um, and in all cases giving um, close attention to the explanation about decision making given by farmers, fishermen, other people in the supply chain, um, and the value they explicitly place on the mobile phone. Um, the study has become over the years sort of more and more comparative, so these are some observations that's, that I started to kind of make in, in Uganda. 
I have a student um, who graduated last year, Elisa Aurelia, who's listed here, who um, uh, did some similar research in rural China with farmers. Um, I ended up doing a project with Janaki Srinivasan, another student who graduated from our PhD program, looking at fishermen in Kerala. And um, uh, Janet Kwame, who's also listed on this title slide, is my co-PI for this NSF grant, and we've done some work looking at um, market women in Ghana. And all of these sites talking about mobile phone use and decision making, and at some point or another getting around to this question about market prices. So it's been radically comparative sort of between sites. Um, it's been comparative between disciplinary approaches, so I'll, I'll show you in a minute. I'm going to talk a little bit about a, a um, particular study by an economist that might be the, kind of the source of this thinking. Um, might or might not. Um, it's become comparative between, uh, you know, sort of the expert sphere, the descriptions of experts and the descriptions of farmers, it, and it's comparative between sort of abstracted economic models and um, implementations, uh, technological implementations of those models um, in the form of market information systems, which I'll also talk about. Okay, so let me give a little bit of, a, of background on what I'm calling the career of information and development policy. So this notion of information scarcity and its solution um, through you know, this infrastructure providing information, digital technologies, is really promised on the notion of information as a, what I'm describing as a substanceless substance. So it's the kind of unique value of information is that it allows you to escape the scarcity of other forms of capital. Um, physical or financial capital, it's understood as infinitely reproducible and essentially costless. Um, a really good example of that kind of thinking uh, in a report in the aid world um, is a report of the Digital Opportunity Initiative. It was this group that formed in the aftermath of the G8 summit in 2000. And to, in 2000. A lot of this talk and thinking really sort of bubbled to the surface right around the, the turn of the millennium. Um, and at the G8 summit, there was this, what they call private public private partnership that formed with representatives from the ITU, the OECD, UNESCO, and they produced this report, which has this really kind of juicy little piece about how they're thinking about information and its radical potential. So I'm going to read just a bit from that report. It says that ICT fosters the dissemination of information and knowledge by separating content from its physical location. So that's just right there, a little bit of kind of substanceless substance. Um, this flow of information is largely impervious to geographic boundaries allowing remote communities to become integrated into global networks and making information, knowledge, and culture accessible in theory to anyone. The digital and virtual nature of many ICT products and services allows for zero or declining marginal costs. Replication of content is virtually free regardless of its volume and marginal costs for distribution and communication are near zero. As a result, ICT can radically reduce transaction costs and there's sort of several styles of language wrapped up in that quote, but it, it, it represents this kind of thinking about information and its, its possibility for remote communities, you know, transcending physical distance, being costless. Um, I was out sort of doing my dissertation field work right around the time that the World Summit on the Information Society was running. This was from 2003 to 2005. And I was able to actually participate in a um, in a, one of the regional conferences which was held in, in Ghana. And I, I'm, I would describe that as sort of an early point of culmination of this idea about information. Um, the, there's a, an article that describes kind of information and development policy as being productively vague. Um, and I think the, the kind of sense that it's productively vague uh, stems from the fact that it's often sort of not attached to any particular tech technical platforms. And that was certainly true at WISIS. The reports describe information without actually concretely talking about any particular platforms or, or um, you know, computers or, or applications. And that's turned out to be a really kind of sensible strategy because there have been these waves of sort of technological change in the, in 
the Global South following from that, that conference that were not anticipated at that time. In 2003 to 2005, there was a lot of talk about computers and telecenters and internet cafes. I did a study of internet cafes, and now the conversation in the development sector has really kind of shifted over wholesale into talk about mobile phones and smartphones. Um, but the sort of claims about information have been pretty effortlessly relocated from you know, computers to mobile phones. Um, okay, so I, I said I would talk, I mean the title of the talk is about um, the the um, importance of price information to fishers and to economists. So I'm going to do sort of um, try to make a good effort at describing one particular um, paper, one particular study by a development economist, which has had um, a, a it has garnered a lot of attention and really gotten a lot of traction in um, the development sector and, and among people who do. Um, digital technology work to address development problems. So the paper is called The Digital Provide. It's by Robert Jensen. It was published in 2007. And I think it's, it's helpful to sort of think about this paper in its scholarly context. Um, it was uh, written and published in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, which is one of the very top journals in, in the field. Um, it was addressed to an audience of economists trained in, in the field. Um, and I you know, as I've tried to kind of make sense of this particular study and relate it to what I'm hearing in the broader conversations about um, development and information, um, I've tried to understand what it is that, you know, interests economists so much in this concept of information. Um, what I'm able to understand from kind of a non-specialized reading is that it goes along with a history of assumptions in the field about market functioning early assumptions that market actors are acting from a position of perfect information. And then as economists began to question that assumption, um, they started to become interested in what it means for information to be maldistributed or unavailable. What does that do to markets? What does that do to market efficiency? Um, so Robert Jensen, who's a development economist, um, saw an opportunity, this is you know, in the mid-90s, to do a, what he called a natural experiment. And uh, he, for whatever reason, he knew that they were about to um, start set up some cell phone towers along the coast of North Kerala. Um, and this is actually a map of that, that region. So he thought, okay, here's an opportunity to see what happens in um, a situation where information is maldistributed and a new technology comes into play that will presumably enhance the, the efficient distribution of information. Um, so he set up in 1996 with a team of people to collect surveys and every week they went to the, to the um, beach markets and surveyed fishing boats as they came in to find out what price, you know, how much fish they brought in, he was looking at sardines, what price they sold their fish for and some other kind of details, those are the two important pieces of information and that survey was carried out weekly from 1996 to 2001. Um, these cell phone towers came into place, you can probably can't read it from where you're sitting, but they, the dates when those cell phone um, towers were built is, is listed on the map. So around 2000, at the bottom 1997 um, was the first cell phone tower in the region and they, um, 98, 2000, gradually each region got cell phone coverage and people started using cell phones, including fishermen. Um, okay, so the findings of this study um, showed that, uh, oh, that's the evidence, which I've already covered. Um, he was able to show that with the arrival of the mobile phones, there were some measurable improvements in market efficiency. And how that was measured was looking at prices and what economists refer to as price dispersion. So before the arrival of the mobile phones, prices were kind of arbitrary. It had to do with where people were catching fish. They were going into the nearest beach market to sell those fish. And so when there was an oversupply in one area, the fish were cheap, and then when there was an undersupply, they were expensive. Um, with the arrival of the mobile phone, um, and this he was talking to fishermen, fishing teams that were bringing in the fish, what the practice was that they would call around to different beach markets, find out where the best price was given how far they had to travel, and then sell their fish there. 
And that's what this graph very neatly kind of illustrates, the, the, um, the shift of prices into kind of this narrow band where they're not kind of um, being arbitrarily set anymore. So that's the kind of, kind of compelling visual illustration of this gain in market efficiency. Um, another thing that he noted in the study was that um, sometimes fishermen came into the port and there was no one to sell the fish to so they just dump them on the beach. And, and so that, that went away after these phones became available. And finally, that um, welfare, there were welfare gains. And in, in economic terms, welfare is being measured here in terms of income. So fishing units gained more profits from their fish. And that's from a development perspective that's more important. A more efficient market might be um, something that, that uh, disadvantages poor fishermen and advantages rich fishermen, which isn't really kind of a strong development finding. Um, but this actually showed that both large-scale and small-scale fishing units um, realized improvements in income. So this is sort of, if we're pointing to kind of a source for this idea that mobile phones are being used to check market price information, this is most likely the source. This is the scholarly source for that idea. Um, importantly, as I want to kind of draw attention to, this was really a study sort of incidentally of mobile phones. It wasn't really a study that was about mobile phone use. It was a study about information and its distribution. Um, as the, the study has become part of kind of wider lore, it's become about mobile phones. And that I think is sort of the source of what makes this, makes the myth and makes it interesting to look at. Okay, so I'm gonna now talk a little bit about um, market price information, um, not simply as part of a sort of a neoclassical economic model, but as a development truism. So um, here's Robert Jensen's study. Uh, here is the study in The Economist that reported on, the, um, the article in The Economist that reported on it. Um, widespread, widespread media coverage of this particular study. Um, and here is uh, sort of this, this report from the World Bank cites Jensen's study, but also has some kind of language like this, which is sort of the typical way in which this myth circulates. So farmers in Africa are accessing pricing information through text messages. Um, it's really interesting to think about this. So a study about how fishermen use mobile phones in northern Kerala becomes, in a roundabout way, a claim about farmers in Africa using, accessing price information through text messages. A lot of slippages there. So, um, I, I've spent years studying rumor, um, which has made me what I think I would describe as especially attuned to social truth. Um, that is the kind of truth that's secured through repetition that's spread through social networks that gains legitimacy through that kind of repetition. And I, I see in this um, repetition, you know, increasingly this sort of tone in, of conviction and vague generality. I, I would point to um, uh, the concept of deletion of modalities, which Latour and Wol Wolgar talk about, sort of the uh, location of a fact in a particular instance in a lab, in a study, that becomes gradually a more generally accepted fact. And you can sort of see that slippage in this, kind of the from the study to the, the broader claim about what farmers in Africa are doing with their mobile phones. Um, what's interesting about this is not simply that, you know, a, a particular study of a particular time and place, a particular kind of use of mobile phones has become a broader claim about how people in the farmers in the global south are using phones, but also the way this has been put into action um, and built into technological systems. So there are a number of these market information systems. Um, here are, are three of the most well-known. One, um, Nokia Life Tools, I'm not sure if that one's still operating. There's Isoko, which was started in Ghana and which is um, in several countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. And there's a system called Reuters Market Light, um, which is, in, is available in, in throughout India. Um, and all of these systems provide market price information. Often it's provided through SMS. So it's not a, a voice-based system, but it's provided as a little nugget of text in a, in a text message. 
Um, you know, an interesting, n another layer to this contradiction that I originally observed um, has come through recent uh, econometric studies that have looked at, have actually evaluated some of these systems and come up basically with negative results. So, for example, Reuters Market Light was recently studied and they found that adoption was really low. People weren't using this system. Um, and often in kind of measuring the impact of MIS, market information systems, they find that they don't somehow, despite the sort of these initial early studies and this conviction and this idea of market price information, um, they don't improve market efficiency in the ways that were expected. So kind of reconciling, you know, studies like Jensen's with these recent studies of MIS is, um, is something to, to think about. So I mentioned that this was a study that for me originated in what seemed to be a contradiction between the kind of lore in the development world and conversations I was having with farmers and fishermen. Um, it didn't originate in questions of theory, but in the process of trying to make sense of it, I've been drawing from the resources of science and technology studies, um, delving a little bit into economic sociology, uh, calling back on my early um, work and work practice studies, um, sort of in a piecemeal fashion. And I, I mentioned um, kind of thinking about market price information as a social truth and the way it's circulating in the wider development community. I also think it may be helpful to think of it as a boundary object. So um, I participate in an interdisciplinary field called ICTD, Information Communication Technologies and Development. And you know, people are coming into that interdisciplinary community from a variety of different backgrounds, but we're all grappling with you know, some similar questions um, and trying to use each other's work that approaches those questions from different disciplinary angles. Um, so a boundary object is something shared that's understood through a shared common language when people talk about market price information in ICTD. That's a, a term, a concept that we all think we understand. Um, but there's a risk with these boundary objects, which is that as they move between kind of disciplinary spaces or between scholarship and practice, there's a risk that the interpretive context that, through which we make sense of them is lost. So the way that market price information is studied is understood by economists and the assumptions that are brought to bear on that and the ways in which it can be extended or applied, um, those understandings are not necessarily shared by computer scientists or system builders or other people who think they can take Jensen's study and, for example, build a market information system. Um, there's some really um, useful work in economic sociology, particularly where it intersects with STS, thinking about the performativity of economic models, um, which has helped steer me away from sort of the bland observation that Jensen's model doesn't match with reality. Yeah, so what? Um, and um, I think that um, this work is more to try and sort of diagnose the rise of market price information within this community of experts and practitioners and to try and understand and sort of diagnose the failure, especially of MIS. What's, what's failing in translation that such an idea can't be built and implemented in a way that's successful? Where, where are those kind of mistranslations taking place? And they, there are broader questions here I think about um, application and implications. So in, over in the iSchool we're often called upon as social scientists to think about the implications for design. How do we take what you're finding out about you know, youth in Ghana using the internet cafes and build better technologies for them? And in policy worlds I think similarly um, you know, social scientists are called upon to, to, to um, speak to the implications for policy. And that translation work is, is certainly not straightforward and it's, and it's easy to screw up I guess is the way I would put it. Um, and this project is really sort of trying to figure out how and why that, that work is so difficult. Um, I also mentioned I've listed work practice studies up here and that's really sort of shaped the method um, that I've undertaken in this work. Um, so I've relied as much as possible on direct observation, um, talking to fishermen, talking to farmers. You know, we're, in that work, we're treating them as the authority about their own work, right? They, they know how they do what they do. Um, we, we've been looking at the interlinkages between their decision-making and kind of their broader social world. 
Um, and just like sort of the original work and work practice studies, we're looking at how digital technology is beginning to mediate work. And that's something you can certainly do in parts of Sub-Saharan Africa where people are using mobile phones. Some of the same sort of methods and insights really apply. Okay, um, so what I'm gonna do in the next set of slides is talk about um, sort, of, sort of four alternatives to the myth of market price information. Um, grounding that, those alternatives in direct conversations that I and my collaborators have had with farmers and fishermen. Um, so I call it a fourfold myth. Um, so in these conversations, I mean these are just kind of one conversation pulled out of a vast body of data, so keep that in mind, but I think it's really useful to see um, how you know, practices of mobile phone use are spoken about sort of intact to see the language that's used and the, the way that um, people are actually describing both the value of their mobile phone and the way they go about trade. Um, so, you know, the first insight is simply that often in these conversations we are, we're not finding people talking about information in the same way as it's understood in, in, as a development concept and they're not necessarily describing it as something, something that's scarce. Um, information in general or information on prices. Um, I had this really kind of hilarious interview. Um, I was with a research team that wanted to find out all the different kinds of information that these um, fishermen wanted, like the categories of information that they wanted. And I use it as an example of how not to do interviews when I teach qualitative research methods. Um, so the, the question started out like, how, what, you know, tell us the two types of information you would like to have. And the first thing we found was that there wasn't really a word that translated adequately between the English word information and a Luganda word. So the word information was among some of them that the, word, the English word was known. Um, but in Luganda it was translated in, into something more like news. That was sort of the rough equivalent. Um, so this is from the end of the interview, but this interviewer, the translator we were working with asked, you know, if you want information on fishing issues, um, the information you'll be most interested in, what will it be talking about? And this fisherman responded, as for the information I'd be interested in, um, is that the government has put in a good place, or put, in, put in place a good way of fishing, like giving people new fishing nets. And that followed from a long string of questions where, you know, what kind of health information would you like? We'd like information that they're going to build a health clinic nearby. Um, what kind of, uh, we'd like the information that they're going to build a school nearby because the kids have to walk a really far distance. Some of that has to do with the word information being translated into news. And you can see that that might be a more kind of adequate response to a question about news. Um, but it also had to do with a kind of pushback from these fishermen who are saying, okay, well, you know, it's nice to listen to the radio, but if you're here and you're asking us what we want, what we want is a health clinic. We want something, we don't want information in the way that you seem to be um, insisting that we understand it. Okay, the second um, aspect of this myth. Um, in, in conversations about decision making, kind of holistic conversations that weren't exclusively focused on market prices, um, what we often heard was that market prices were subordinate to other factors in the way they were making decisions about trade. Um, and a couple of those factors were attitudes towards risk, okay, and, and long-standing trade relationships. So um, this, these two quotes sort of encapsulate all of that. The first is uh, an interview I did with a sort of a middleman. This is a guy who stood on the um, beach. This is on Lake Victoria in Uganda and bought fish from guys who went out to sea and put it in his truck and took it to a, a market um, further into the, into the country. Um, and the whole dynamic of trade there was interesting because um, these middlemen played this really critical role in providing ice, providing equipment, providing gas to the boats that went out to catch fish. And so, of course, those guys came back and sold to the guy who, le who lent them money. That's sort of, it's kind of a simple and straightforward, um, you know, economic contingency that would limit 
this sort of decision making based on prices. But I think what was more interesting is how he described the relationships that he had with the people he was buying fish from. So um, this, this gets at sort of the, the significance of the types of relationships he has with people and the limited value of sort of pure information. So he said uh, about um, buying, buying fish from someone. Some other people can lie to you that they will give you cash immediately if you bring the fish, but then when you bring it, they disappoint you. Okay, so there's a kind of a, a distance there between um, the, what might be imparted in the phone call and, what, and the, the actual reality once this, this person comes to land on the, the beach. Um, the second example um, d is a smoked fish seller who described her relationship with her supplier um, and it was interesting the way she described this relationship as one in which she minimized any disruption to his life or any kind of demands on his time or his resources. So she said, I've been his customer for a long time. I've been dealing with him for three years now. I buy from him at a good price. I don't disturb him. Um, and this is linked to that, that comment. I'm gaining some money, which I use for children's school fees. And actually, this was continuous with what we heard from um, Gideon Market Women as well, was this, this desire not to kind of maximize profits, but to maintain the a continuous supply of profits to be able to buy your daily bread. Um, links into all kinds of things. Risk, attitudes towards, towards risk being one of those, those things. Um, so there's a, certainly a logic to the way they're making these decisions and thinking about their decision making, but it's not sort of a abstracted, um, purely economic logic. Okay, so that's the second aspect of the myth. Um, the third thing we heard kind of recurrently in these, these studies in, in different countries was that, um, well, this is actually something we sort of have concluded from what people described to us, which is that there are ways in which market efficiency could potentially be improved that actually don't really have to do with information at all or the circulation of, of market prices. Um, and one sort of constant refrain in, in talking to people in all of these countries was that the mobile phone was valued because it saved them from making wasted trips, right? So you call a shop and you find out that the electricity's out, you don't waste time trying to get there. Or the shipment you're waiting for hasn't come in yet, right? So a pretty simple, straightforward, um, way of understanding the value of the mobile phone. And I think this comes down to what I would describe as practices of coordination, right? So what's happening when a buyer and a seller talk? Perhaps some of that's exchanging information, but it's also about synchronizing themselves in time and space, right? And all kinds of information um, circulating in that conversation, not simply about market prices. Um, this is an example, and you can imagine, actually I, so I, at one point, I emailed Robert Jensen about his study um, to ask a few questions about um, some, al some of these alternate explanations we were coming to. And from his perspective, this really wasn't a different finding. So if they're calling and coordinating, that's another type of information that nonetheless is improving market efficiency. Um, has very different implications for designing a market information system, though. Uh, so this is an example of like a very kind of clear, concise example of that coordination work. Um, the this uh, fisherman that I talked to said that um, you know we were asking him about how he used his phone and why he valued it, and he said um, one time the engine failed when we were supposed to arrive here at the the market at 4 p.m. and if we didn't get in contact with the people here, the truck would leave us. So we had to inform them about our problem and assure them that we were coming. We arrived at almost 10 a.m., right? So that's you know, many hours later than was planned because of engine failure in the storm. But because we had informed them, they were here waiting for us. So the phone helped us so much. Right? That's coordination work. Um, the, the point I want to make about coordination work is that I don't think it really conforms to this idea of information as an extractable good, right? That you can store in a database and you can circulate. Um, it's, it's an altogether different way of handling information as embedded in physical practice, moving, you know, 
moving with goods on the roads or on the, on the, um, on the lake. Okay, and then the final, um, the, the fourth element of this myth um, that I think is maybe the most important one um, is just the kind of huge variety of ways in which these traders, farmers, fishermen talked about and valued their mobile phone, um, which, you know, kind of in the wake of this concept of market price information being sort of the, the quintessential success story, as I've described it, overshadows all of those other valued uses and, and the possibilities for designing applications and things that might build upon those uses. Um, so this is uh, from a, a study I did with Janaki Srinivasan in, in Kerala. And that study, we actually went back to the sites where Jensen carried out his original study um, to raise broader questions about mobile phones. What else are people doing with mobile phones? Um, and we certainly got confirmation from some fishermen that they were using the phone to call and check prices and decide where to sell their goods. Um, but that was in the spectrum of a huge range of um, mobile phone practices. Um, one which he dismisses in his study, um, fish finding. So fishing teams would call, when they found a pocket of good fishing, they'd call their brothers or their, you know, relative, their cousin's fish or fishing boat and tell them where to, to catch the, the fish. Which in a certain kind of purely rational sense, a, a kind of atomistically rational sense, um, is they're kind of, they're shooting themselves in the foot in a sense, right? Why don't they just catch the fish and not tell anyone and they can continually, um, you know, reap the profits from that, that practice, but that wasn't the way that these fishermen thought about, um, about fish. So they combined GPS devices with mobile phones to do fish finding, coordination work that's a, appeared in every site that we've done this work, calling and finding out where someone is, when they can be expected to arrive, how much, you know, fish or, or, you know, onions or tomatoes they're coming with. Um, for women in the fishing industry, there was this continual concern about how their children were doing back at the house, so there was that kind of um, affective uh, family work that they were doing with their phones. And um, for many people, especially in fishing, which is a very kind of exposed, risky um, activity, uh, phones were absolutely critical for being able to call when you need to be rescued. And that could mean the engine died, there's a storm, on Lake Victoria, there was a big problem with pirates. Um, so your, your, your boat could be attacked by pirates. And if you could hide your mobile phone, you could call and get someone to, um, to tow you in because they would, they would steal the engine. Okay, so I want to now kind of conclude by talking about market information systems and kind of bringing together all of this um, all of these observations about the value of mobile phones to sort of diagnose why they, why they seem to fail so often. And when I describe them as failing, I mean in the sense, I've sort of started this talk by describing this, that the rates of adoption are really poor. Um, th there's a study of Reuters Market Light in India which found that farmers just weren't adopting the, this service. They didn't seem to be interested in using it. Um, other so there's a study in Peru that found a similarly limited impact specifically on market efficiency. So these claims about kind of the circulation of information um, uh, improving the market have not proven to be the case, um, specifically in the use of market information systems. So market information systems take this idea, you put the market prices in a database and then you access it often through SMS. Um, the, the kind of my main conclusion about this is that um, when information is extracted in that way, outside of trade relationships, presented impersonally, it's not attached to someone who's going to pay that price, it loses its usefulness. That should be kind of obvious. Um, but there's, we can also draw from speech acts theory to sort of make sense, distinguishing between locutionary and illocutionary acts, aspects of speech. So locutionary are the things the speaker says, right? So in a call about market prices, that's the price of fish at the market. The illocutionary act is the force of what is said. And so when someone calls about fish, 
Not only is a price communicated, so is a commitment to buy the fish at that price. And um, in talking to farmers and fishermen about those phone calls they were placing, that was absolutely critical. A database with a list of numbers was not a commitment to buy a, price, uh, buy a fish at that price. And that sort of lost in the abstraction from an economic model and a translation into the, the application um, of market prices into sort of a database, an MIS model. There's another interesting aspect of this which seems to be kind of too easily overlooked, which is um, the, that conversion from a phone call to SMS is not simply a more kind of cost-effective way to deliver information. Um, I think, you know, Jensen's study is about market price information, but the way that that market price information was embodied was in these voice-based phone calls. And um, the translation of that into SMS, it's not the same thing. And it in introduces a literacy barrier that wasn't there. Um, so that's another reason that MIS may, f may fail, because not only is that price extracted from an actual trade relationship, it's communicated in a format that is not accessible to anyone who has um, limited literacy. So there's a number of implications for design from this kind of review and, and examination of um, market in information systems and why they fail, and the broader kind of myth of, um, of market price information as a concept in the, the development industry. Um, I am going to conclude there. I have just a few concluding comments. Um, the point of this study to provide the sort of comparison between a model in an economic study an, an understanding of that model in, a broad, in the broader development industry and uh, the practice of, of that model in MIS and relating that to um, the way farmers and fishermen talk about market in price information and their decision making was not um, simply to provide sort of another account of economic misrepresentation in the real world but um, was an attempt to sort of map out the patterns and the missteps in the way economic knowledge is extrapolated and materialized in applications such as MIS. So starting with that sort of deletion of modalities, the, the study of fishermen in North Kerala becomes some kind of claim about farmers in Africa using text messaging. Um, and the kind of em embodiment and enactment of that concept in a database is another sort of misstep, a misrepresentation of the um, economic concept. I think the broader point here is about how um, scholarly conceptualizations can sort of overwhelm the on-the-ground priorities. Um, I wonder what a field like ICTD would be like if we could all kind of address problems without the burdens of belonging to disciplines, like a post, truly po being truly post-disciplinary. Uh, is, maybe that's the problem, is this attachment to disciplines. I, I don't know how to shed my discipline. I've been trained in it for so long that the prospect's a little scary. Um, and it's also a call, I think, in a more practical sense for methodological diversity, um, both in ICTD, which is the field that I participate in, and in development policy and practice. Um, there's some very sort of narrow definitions of empiricism that it's you know, this is one of the first things I do in my methods class is we talk about what we mean by empirical. That doesn't mean numbers, that doesn't mean quantification, that means, you know, observations based in sense experience out in the world, and that includes things like interviews and observations. Um, yeah, but in this space of sort of development work, you know, often what's considered sort of convincing are the empirical data in the sort of more narrow sense um, and that prevents the methods that we've been utilizing through these kind of small-scale ethnographic studies from being routinely incorporated into the way knowledge about poverty is generated in those those domains. Um, you know, it's, I think it's reasonable to question the very coherence of categories and concepts like information and that conversation doesn't routinely happen. You know, the, the, the blunt reality of going into a village and interviewing people about the information needs they have and finding that we, can, we have to start with the word information, that that's not a shared concept. Um, 
I think in the absence of that kind of more integrated post-disciplinary conversation, we end up with this sort of echo chamber where you continually hear people talking about and reinforcing this compelling myth, um, in this case about farmers using mobile phones to get price information. Um, we have, uh, as part of this project, a website that, uh, where there's a working paper called The Myth of Market Price Information that goes into some detail about what I've talked about today. Uh, the study that I carried out with Janaki Srinivasan, where we uh, actually went back to Kerala and looked at the sites where Jensen carried out his study, that's there too if you want to take a look at it. And I'm happy to take any questions at this point.